myself again. But it's the only Good evening and welcome to NUFC Matters. It is ladies night and tonight is a pre-recorded show uh, because I was unavailable to do a live. But you can still have uh, your say and your comments in the chat section on YouTube. Uh, so please feel free to chat and it's uh, a welcome to uh, our regular pundits and it's Kendall, Samantha and Sav joining us uh, today. Hi girls. Hiya. Hi. Uh, great win, it has to be said. Uh, early goal from uh, Miggy Almiron, the quickest goal uh, Newcastle have scored in the Premier League, all bar uh, Alan Shearer's, of course, against Man City in 2003, which was quite funny on match of the day on Saturday. I'm not sure if you saw it, but uh, Gary Lineker and Ian Wright actually slowed it down Alan Shearer's goal, and they're claiming that VAR would have ruled Alan Shearer's uh, goal out for a handball. Uh, that made for interesting viewing. And then uh, the second goal, the winning goal, scored by Dwight Gale after a wonderful cross by Moon. Murphy, of course, both of them coming on as uh, substitutes. So, uh, first, uh, your views on the game, Kendall. What, what did you make of that win against West Brom? Uh, well, 20 seconds, I was like, get in. This could be like 3 4 nil. Yeah, like, when do we ever see that very often? Um, and then, you know, about 10 minutes after that, uh, yeah, it all started to go a bit downhill after that. Um, we struggled again up until last minute once again. Obviously, the subs... Fair enough. Impact subs definitely were that. Um, Murphy and Gale. Murphy's cross was phenomenal. Like I literally could sit and watch that on repeat all day. It was amazing. Um, and I was so happy to see Dwight Gale come back and get a goal. Like that was brilliant. Hayden at centre back. At first, I was a bit like, "What on earth is going on?" Um, but he had an absolute blind and ended up getting man of the match. So can't really complain there. Callum Wilson did some dug in and did some pretty hard work considering, you know, he was a striker. He did a decent job yesterday again. Um, other than that, what's really to say? It was a hard fought three points and we've got three points that we desperately need, especially one in the next couple of fixtures over Christmas. So can't really complain in that sense. If it's three points, you don't play well and still get the three points, as people like to point out. So, yeah. Yeah, good stuff. Good three points, Samantha. Uh, what was your views on the game? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't easy on the eye. Um, I missed the first goal because I was still trying to get into the pub. I was given the doorman absolute grief um, because he'd already been, you know, taking the piss out of me because I was a Newcastle supporter. Um, but yeah, you know what? As Kendall said, we dug in, we got three points. I think I'm just of the opinion now that it doesn't matter how we play. It's just about the points on the board now. Um, same the the Murphy cross was like Gillespie against Barcelona it was just you know where did it come from and if you watch kind of you know Shelby passing the ball out to him there was just nothing happening we had the last 10 minutes of the game we need another goal and nobody's moving nobody's making runs you know when he just he takes a chance and even when the ball went into the box we only had two players trying to get in there to score and it was just perfect for Gail who I thought was really really good when he came on so you know there was a few per performances but overall we got the three points and that's all that matters Yes yeah, Sab what was your take on the game yesterday 2-1 win against West Brom Yeah I completely agree I mean I don't think you can look at it and say that we played outstanding that first 10 minutes you know we actually looked quite decent and then it's like we get to a certain point and then we go, oh, no, actually, we're going to sit back. And it's like the confidence goes and we just sit back and defend and let them run at us. And that's when the goals will come in against us, because if you're not getting the ball forward, then it's just going to stay in your area. Um, I thought, um, oh, where was it? Miggy, I thought he played really well yesterday. Um, who else? I say that cross by Murphy. That was that was really good. And Wilson. You know, he was he was making me laugh yesterday with what he was getting up to. But, but you know, he, he tries and that's just the main thing. Um, but, yeah, it was it was a really poor performance. I wish that we could play like we did in that first 10 minutes for the whole 90 minutes. Um, but, unfortunately, we just don't tend to do that. But, yeah, it, it's a lucky three points. I'll take the three points anyway. 
we did the match day live and I think when you watched it back uh, you know the first half we were all really you know excited it was a great start that early goal Kendall got us you know got us out of our seats and we thought it was going to be a, a landslide and Joe Linton came you know came out of his shell again they seemed to seem to be doing well in the first half but then at half time it just seemed to change um, was that down to West Brom substitutions because they did bring on you know two attacking options um, you know to, to try and change the game um, Newcastle, of course, left their substitutions till a bit later. Obviously, their their substitutions paid off. Murphy and Gale obviously combining for the for the winning goal. But um, you know, it did seem to be very much a game of two halves. And I think a lot of the criticism that's been levelled at Steve Bruce and the team again is that you know we don't seem to attack when we get into a winning position. Yeah, hundred percent. Like it, when we you know go one goal up, or to be honest, it works both ways. If we go one goal up or one goal down, we we. St- like continue to sit back because against teams like Chelsea, for example, and um, when you know one nil down, then I'm sure Steve Bruce just says they might just defend the one nil. Like a one nil defeat is worse than a three nil defeat. And yes, while it is fair enough, it's still a defeat. So I never understand that. Um, and as you say, their attack, they obviously brought on attacking options yesterday's subs, which it showed because from like the the kick off in the second half till about seventy five minutes, they were just pressing all the time and um, it was like really really hard to watch because obviously we know that they've only had one win all season and it was only like two games ago um, and they're not doing well it was like a chance to you know for us to get an easy three well not an e- necessarily an easy three points because you always make things difficult but um, a, a decent three points a guarantee three points obviously we got them but for honestly they embarrassed us from pretty much most of the second half yesterday um we just had no defensively apart from Isaac Hayden who was absolutely phenomenal yesterday playing out of position after having coronavirus as well um defensively Kraft and Lewis um had really really difficult games yesterday I wasn't happy with either of them, either of them if I'm honest um obviously Yedlin came on with not that long to go uh, I probably thought it could have been brought on a little bit sooner but yeah, they uh, pressed massively yesterday, and their subs obviously, well, you'd say they worked, um, because obviously they lost. But for what they wanted to do, they did work at the time. And then Gail and uh, Murphy were massive for us. And I think, if to be fair to them, I think they probably deserve to start next game, um, if that's going to be the case, because they showed the most create creativity yesterday, aside from obviously Almiron's goal, where Joe Linton and Wilson both did really, really, really well. Um, they showed the most spark all game after the second half yesterday. So, yeah, I think they probably both deserve to start, in my opinion, on um, against Leeds next game. Yes, Amanda, there does seem to be a big, a big issue with his half-time team talks. I think we've discussed this in depth before, but it doesn't seem as if he has the the charisma, or, or you know, we often say he doesn't have a plan A or a plan B. Um, you know, and it always leaves that little bit of a, you know, I don't know, a negativity surrounding a win. I mean, we, we should be happy. We're one two one. We're, we're we're troubling the the, the mid table and top end of the table instead of the bottom end of the table, but. We played a West Brom team who are struggling uh, towards the bottom of the table and and essentially could go down this season. But I think West Brom probably had better possession than us as well. You know, it's it, it's frustrating, isn't it? It is, and you know he doesn't know whether to stick or twist. I think he spends so much time thinking about the other team and what they're going to do and how they're going to set up. And they had five in midfield, and I thought Longstaff was really poor yesterday, which didn't help. We just never, we don't know when to make the runs, when to get the ball forward. The decision making's really, really poor. You know, you've got Jamal Lewis, who had a, a really poor game yesterday, but the guy's scared to go over the halfway line. Kraft is a useless player. Like, he's just, I mean that, I don't mean that disrespectfully, but I don't see what he brings to the right hand side. I just think, I did, you know, you don't notice he's on the pitch, he, he brings so little. Um, so, when it comes down to Bruce, I mean, you know, he wants to be a nice guy, but I I feel like even if he's putting his arm around the shoulders of a player, he doesn't have confidence in them. Everything's shackled. It's all about, you know, can I make this decision or what will the repercussions be? So nobody really does anything. Um, and they all expect somebody else to take responsibility. Whereas West Brom, who have been absolutely battered recently, just went out and played their game. They were the away team and they just played the way that they wanted to play because their manager believes in it. And when he saw something wasn't working the way he wanted it to, he he reacted with changes. 
Now, we didn't train together. COVID probably had a bit of a, an influence um, on the fitness levels, etc. But that aside, I just don't feel like Bruce has instilled any kind of ethos in the team of the way that he wants them to play that will get them forward. And whether it's before kickoff or at half time, I think it's just always going to be the same and we are going to grind out results against anybody, whether you know they're one of the top teams and we get a good win or one of the bottom teams and we labour to get a win. I don't think he changes anything dramatically. Um, but that said, it's still three points, but I do think West Brom were better um, and I think they can feel a wee bit hard done by. Yeah, I would agree. Um, look, I think it's a good point you make, Samantha, about the COVID uh, outbreak, you know, because, you know, the, the lads haven't been able to train. So I suppose, again, that, that you know, that is in favour. And look, I'm not I'm not beating Bruce up. I know a lot of people who watch this on a regular basis, you know, will have heard us, you know, will have criticised Bruce and rightly so. But, you know, credit where credit's due again, you know, he's managed to get a result. He made the substitutions at the right time, you know, as, as far as the match is concerned. And the two players that he brought on made the difference. Murphy with the cross, Gail with a fantastic goal, great header, um, and he and he's managed to get another result. And um, you know, I'm 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 not on a downer, but far from it. Um, it's just it is just slightly frustrating um, when when you see this. And I and, and I do think I think ultimately what most fans will have to realise is that we are at this moment in time going to be sticking with Steve Bruce because you know until there is some kind of resolution with a takeover then there will be no decision made on, on the managerial position and as long as Steve Bruce is keeping Newcastle's head above water then we're always going to be you know we're always going to be together and um, that that's the position we're in Samantha yeah agreed yeah Sav, um, it's it's that half time thing again, you know, when Newcastle look as if they're gonna go into cruise control and you know, once you get that a goal in the, the first nineteen, twenty seconds, you're thinking that you're gonna go on to score three or four. But um it's the frustrating thing about sitting back, isn't it? Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean I was thinking yesterday when we went in at half time, because we were starting to look a bit laboured before half time. You would think Steve Bruce would sort of pep everyone up a bit, you know, get them back on track make them go out there with a little bit more drive to go forwards and we came out and we're playing the same old crap that we was playing just before half time and just letting them run at us and it's like when he does his press conferences i've said about this a few times he's so he just has this really negative vibe about towards the game towards how he feels about things and if he's like that at a press conference he's going to be instilling that into the players as well and if they go out there believing that we probably aren't can't win it but we've got to try our best that's not the best attitude you look at uh, you know past majors like Bobby Robson Kevin Keegan and their sort of interview style is completely the opposite to Steve Bruce's and I find that really frustrating he had a chance at half time to sort of say Do you know what we've dropped off here a bit we need to get back on and push forward and you know I'm seeing today on um, Twitter people like abusing um, Jamal Lewis because they're saying that he's useless He's not, I don't think he's useless. I think he's badly managed at the moment. He's been thrown into Bruce Ball and he's drowning in it. And that's half the problem. You know, he needs leadership and he needs sort of guidance to know what he's doing. And that is what is lacking throughout the entire squad. And it's so frustrating to see it week after week. You know, I'm happy with the three points. Am I happy with the way we went about getting the three points and sitting there for that whole 90 minutes watching it? No, but, you know, the three points are great and that's just going to help us. But, watching it i don't understand how we're working progress when there doesn't appear to be any progress Find it really frustrating. <laughs> yeah, good point. Um, one of the questions that came up on the chat on the World Wide Show yesterday was that um, Dwight Gale obviously scoring that goal. You know, he'd hit a good run of form, Kendall, before um, you know the injury uh, the back end of last season, and uh, you know he he seems to have found the golden touch again under Steve Bruce. So the question that was asked was, do you think Steve uh, Steve Bruce should look at maybe you know tying him down on a, a, an extended contract? Would would you? Offer him a, another contract, Dwight Gill? Um, I think it completely depends because, as we know, he's very he's injury prone. Pretty much every season, he gets injured um, six weeks plus, um, and it's hard to say because if if you want to improve your squad, we've had Dwight Gill now for what four, five, five, six years now, um, and he hasn't been that 
prolific. Obviously, he hasn't necessarily been first choice striker for like two seasons now. Obviously, well, a season and a half. Um, if you were going to look at improving the squad and maybe bringing in another striker and spending money, obviously, Callum Wilson steal at twenty million in my opinion. Um, in this you know in this day and age of football, then maybe not. Maybe you would think you know Dwight Gale could probably move on elsewhere. Maybe. Um, it's a difficult one because you say that and he'll go to a championship side, as we've seen with Adam Armstrong, as we've seen with Ivan Tony, and hit massive goal tallies like they're doing right now. Oh, we all saw him in the championship. If he never had that six week injury, as I've said, he always gets six week plus injuries. Um, Chris Wood would have never beat him to top score in the championship when we were there. So it's difficult. I think it's be- maybe better to leave it to the end of the season, see if he if he's going to play two up top. In my opinion, he probably deserves to be um in the squad there with Wilson. Um maybe leave it to the end of the season, see what he does. I really don't know. We don't know what's gonna happen. We're still in limbo with everything that's going on. Um so I think it's a bit of a difficult question at the minute because we don't know if we got we would improve that area any any otherwise because we don't really have anyone else there. So yeah, I think it's probably a waiting game with that one. Yeah, okay. Samantha, Dwight Gill, would you give him a new contract? Yeah, pretty similar to what Kendall said. I mean, it's all about fitness. I don't doubt he's a he's a good option, but I mean, if you can't stay fit, you have to cut your losses. He gets fifty grand a week, and you know it's a squad place. We need options. I'm so excited now that we actually have him as an option, and he come on, and, and you know we got that goal yesterday, and that's exactly what you want. And yes, he could be starting up front with Wilson, and we could get excited. You know, they could be a brilliant partnership but he probably won't stay fit. And this is my issue with him. Um, And I know people, you know, it's really 50-50 split for a lot of people on whether we give him a contract or not. I don't don't doubt his ability, but I wouldn't be having those conversations with him yet because, I mean, in three weeks, he could tear a hamstring, you know, easily. Um, He could be put into the team for the next two games and end up, you know, with a calf strain just the way that he's built from what I can tell so you know I find it difficult no conversations yet if he showed some kind of fitness maybe but I think you know at 30 31 whatever age he is as Kendall said he's been around for five six years he's just never been consistent I would cut my losses if he got another injury between now and the end of the season and just say look it's just, it's not working going, you know, there'll be plenty of clubs happy to take them, but it's an area we need to invest in for someone that is just not injured as much. You know, the next option for us is Andy Carl. Less said about that, the better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Sav, Dwight Gale, would you give him a new contract? Yes, yeah, I agree with Kendall and Samantha. I think that it shouldn't, no, that conversation shouldn't be happening at the moment. And like they've said, it's, it's his injury proneness and... You know, there's other better strikers out there than Dwight Gale that we could have, like we, like Kendall said with Callum Wilson. I mean, how great has he been? And if we could find another one sort of like him, I'd happily let Dwight Gale go. Um, I think, you know, he comes on and like yesterday, he did a phenomenal job, but like Samantha said, it's in three games time, he could have another injury and be out for another six, eight, 12 weeks. And then we're sort of screwed again. But no, I would probably send him on his way and find another better striker. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously lots of uh, lots of better strikers out there. Rondon's being linked with a, a return to the Premiership again, and um, you know, Josh King is is another one that's been linked. Kendall, is there anybody who you would like to see Newcastle target in the transfer window? Um, I think, you know, as I say with Callum Wilson, 20 million for a striker of his ability, as we see, was a steal, really. There's not very many other strikers you could get. Um, they're probably, you know, a risk, if you want to if you want to put it that way. Obviously, I know um, Aston Villa got Ollie Watkins. I don't know if it was a little bit less or a little bit more um, than Callum Wilson. And he's smashing it at the moment. So I think Rondon would probably be a good option. But again, for his age, he's not going to be a long-term option for us again. Um, and that's your problem. Do you do you pay for him to come back for one, two seasons? Um, we don't know where we're going to be again. 
it's it's really difficult or do you then try and get someone like ollie watkins for example who is young he's only 20 i think he's 23 um pay a little bit extra but then he might not be as you know as liked or as decent as ron john was so i, I wouldn't let me the decision maker I'm, I'm not gonna lie um i really really wouldn't it's it's tough to decide what you want to do in that sort of situation because callum wilson could have gone either way um and he, he has ended up being so amazing for us because we're not used to having that sort of um goal scorer you know compared to last season so uh josh king for me depends on how much you were going to get him for i think I don't really know. I, he's, I'm not his biggest, massivest fan, but again, I haven't watched him now. Obviously, since he's been relegated, I haven't watched him and or seen him play in the championship. So, I really don't know how he is at the minute. Um, and other than that, I think for that sort of price, knowing that we're not going to pay a lot more than you know what we did for Callum Wilson, unless Mike Ashley has another Joe Linton moment and decides that he just wants to splash forty mil, which is probably unlikely. Um, we're probably we are looking again probably at you know top end of the championship. Um, I know Nathan loves his Troy Deeney and wants Troy Deeney there. Um, whether we could get Troy Deeney for twenty mil, I don't know. But yeah, it's again I would like to be the decision maker. That's for sure. Yeah, Samantha, there's a lot of names there. And I mean, January is just around the corner. The festive season is nearly upon us. And, you know, Mike Ashley will have to make a decision as to whether he gives Steve Bruce any more money to spend. Is there a striker on that shopping list, do you think? And, and you know, is there any names that you would like to see uh, coming into Newcastle to uh, help the problem that we've probably got up front with, uh, as you quite rightly say, Andy Carroll being the backup to a, an injury-prone Dwight Gale? Yeah. The only name that I've thought about recently, and that you know, I don't know how realistic it is, um, would be bringing back Iosi Perez. He's struggled a bit at Leicester. Um, you know, I think things have calmed down. He's been tweeting and liking some stuff about Newcastle recently. So I think you know it's all been smoothed over. But if he if he continues not to be in the Leicester setup, I was such a fan of his, and I know again he divided opinion, but. If Callum's going to be our main man and stay fit, um, then you're kind of looking at that second striker mould, but somebody who could step in and lead the line if Wilson wasn't available. And for me, that's Perez all day, every day. Um, so he, again, you're kind of looking at temporary fixes. A Josh King wouldn't be my choice. A Troy Deeney wouldn't be my choice. But we're going to be so limited if we're even able to get someone in January that it'll be alone in terms of buying a striker. That'll come with the takeover. I mean, the quality of that striker will completely depend on the on the takeover. And if it looks like we're not any further ahead towards the end of the season, then I can see Gail getting a new contract um, because it's the easy choice. Um, so for me, if there was someone to get in on the loan, I just I don't see it as 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 big a priority at the minute because we've got points on the board. We're doing OK. I really would like us to get a box-to-box -box midfielder because I honestly think that is the biggest weakness on our side at the minute. So if we got an attacking option, fine. But at the minute, you know, fingers crossed we don't get an injury to Wilson. But I'm actually okay with, um, you know, having Gail and Carl as a backup to Jill Linton and Wilson. Yeah, OK. Sab, what's your take on uh, the January transfer window? Uh, would you like to see a, a centre-forward come in? Yeah, I mean, I would. I mean, I agree with Sam. I get this weird loyalty to our players, and when they go, I'd actually miss them, depending on who they are, obviously. So I would have Perez back in a heartbeat, and I feel like he's been teasing us with his tweets recently. <laughs> Likes. I'll tell you, another one who's doing that is Willems. He's all yeah. over it at the moment, teasing with his tweets. He put up, when we was playing yesterday, did you see that one where he put up, like, the shifty eyes? <laughs> and I was just like, why? Why are you doing this? If he's if he's not coming back, he's trolling us. That's all I'm saying. Because it's just like, <laughs> it's, it's really frustrating. I'd like to know what's going on. Um, but yeah, I'd take Willems back. I'd take Perez back. Um, I don't know if we're going to get a striker, though. And if it is like Sam said, it will be a loan. Because we've got the two loan places left. Um, I saw us linked, it made me laugh, linked last week or this week um, with Deli Alley. Which was quite funny. I saw that one come out. Um, yeah, Austin PSG. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many rumours that fly about. It's hard to know. But yeah, I would have those those two back um, in January. I'd love that. 
Deli Alley and Shelby in the same team, DMAO, <laughs> or in the same dressing room, should I say? That would be an absolute nightmare. Um, yeah, another another thing which has um, is, is come up is, you know, and we've talked about it on the show before, Kendall, is supporters coming back into grounds. Now, obviously, with the tier system in the UK, we've seen in England that, you know, certain teams, especially down south, you know, Liverpool and as well, Everton, have been allowing supporters back in. We saw it yesterday with, uh, with the Tottenham game as well, supporters that, you know, allow in and uh, a lot of them seem to be getting put behind goals and I've seen quite a bit of uh, a comment on social media about how unfair this is and um, you know it, it's definitely affecting results and when we spoke we spoke to Chris Hall yesterday on the uh, Worldwide show he was talking about um, the Everton game and he was saying that a lot of people down there are saying that you know because Everton had the supporters in um, the hung on for the result against Chelsea do you know what I mean and it, it did help them do you think 2,000 supporters can help do you think do you think it is given these teams who are in these uh, lower tiers an unfair advantage? Well, I've, the thing I've seen mostly is I've seen a couple of players, um, not Premier League players, but, you know, League One Championship players that I know. And they've been put on social media saying that it's better for them to play, even with a couple of fans in, because it just gives them something to play for. Like, it, it's not like a, you know, it's not like a training ground atmosphere. Yet. They know that there's fans there. They want to score the goals for fans. Um, and I can't remember who it had put on, but... It was some player I'd put on the other um, last week when obviously fans were allowed back in, saying it was just amazing to score in front of the fans again. So I think for the mentality of a player, it's probably it probably does help. Two thousand fans fans doesn't seem like a lot, especially in a stadium like St James's Park when you know capacity is fifty two thousand. But I guess any fan is you know a, a minimal amount of fans is better than no fans at all because it just gives a little bit more of an atmosphere. Um, you know, the singing, the shouting. Obviously, with less fans in an empty stadium, you're going to hear it as well. So I can see how, you know, some people are saying that it does help results and it does influence games a little bit more because I can see it. Um, and it's not, you know, 50,000 Geordies on your back negatively. It's only 2,000, so <laughs> it might not sound as bad. Um but yeah, like yesterday, for example, it would just get the team up. It would just, you know, just get the energy of the team up a little bit more, pushing on a little bit more, rather than just dilly dallying around on the field, pressing back all the time. Um, and I suppose as well, in a way, with Jamal Lewis's goal, obviously, if there was two thousand people to shout "man on," like he might have, you know, clicked on a little bit for like quicker than he did yesterday. Um, so I think it, it would definitely help. And obviously, as as we've seen, I don't know if it was today or yesterday, the women's game and um, the Newcastle United women's game, but fans are actually allowed back in there now. I think it's up to a certain amount of people. Um, so it would just be nice to um, have a couple of more fans in, just a little bit more atmosphere and give the players something to play for. Because I think at times Bruce's mentality and the negativity, um, you know, the complacency can rub off a little bit on them. So it would be nice just to give them a kick up the backside, really. Yeah, Samantha, great for the women's game, great for some of the non-league teams who, uh, you know, of course, need the funds to come in, you know, into their game and into the teams and into the into the clubs to keep them keep them active and help them survive. Um, but Newcastle United, of course, still in tier three, uh, won't be seeing fans return um, for, for for quite a while until till we drop to that tier. But is is it is it beneficial? Do you think is it is it an unfair advantage to those teams who who have their supporters in at the minute? Yeah, I think it is. I think I said it at the start. It should be the same rule for everyone um, because they are getting that support. And, you know, these are professional players that, that play for a reason. You know, this is their adrenaline rush. This is, you know, why they train so hard and work so hard. Um, so if you're not playing in front of anybody, it's difficult to motivate yourself. And that's absolutely fine. There are people in the world that need that adrenaline rush they need people to help motivate them so I can't imagine what it's like for them to be walking out you know a job that they've been doing for however long and just not to have that and be trying to find that from within themselves and we don't have a coach in my opinion that will give you that if you're not getting it from the fans and as Kendall said that point about the players complacency even if there were 10 people in the stadium, they would have been shouting to Jamal Lewis, you know, because that was complacency in a nutshell. He just had no awareness. He wasn't he wasn't thinking about the job that he should have been doing. He was ball watching. And you can see little individual things like that happening quite a lot. You know, we've talked about Jeff Hendrick's performances um, and just not being locked in. And I thought Sean Longstaff was pretty poor yesterday, just didn't really do anything. 
Um, so I think that it is unfair. And, you know, I didn't watch the Everton game yesterday, but passionate fans, the Toffee fans, would have been all over that um, in trying to, you know, pull their team through. So, um, you know, hopefully we go down to tier two and get some fans in because I do think the players need it because, as I said, I don't think our coach brings that to the team and they need it from someone. Okay, Sav, same question to you. Is it making much of a difference um, having yeah. those, you know, having those supporters in? Yeah, I think so. Because like, I often, when I watch us, I always think if there was fans in the stadium and they were playing like that, they would be getting some stick over it and they wouldn't want to get that. So they would try, you know, drive a bit harder. And it's like getting forward and things like that. I saw them again yesterday passing the ball back from like quite far up. And I think if there was fans there, they would be pointing that out and it would help the players on the pitch. It's really frustrating. Like, I don't like the fact that some um, clubs have got their fans back and some haven't. I think that's really unfair. Um, and I think it does create an unfair advantage because, you know, they're passionate players and they want people behind them. And like Sam said, Steve Bruce... I mean, if you watch him, you know, like his interviews, he's not the most passionate person. He's very negatively, negative thinking. And if he's the only person you've got behind you, I don't think I could be asked either, to be fair. Um, but, yeah, I do think it creates an unfair advantage. And also, you know, it's the way they've put them in. They're not actually that spread out when you look at it. I think I said this last week. They're all, I don't really, and they've not really got their masks on. But that's just another thing. When is the, um, is it the 16th they're going to do a review on the tiers? Don't yeah, that. yeah. Yeah. So yeah. hopefully, hopefully, go down to tier two. Never know. That's what I'm hoping for, anyway. <laughs> the um, club actually put out something, Kendall. I don't know if you saw it. I picked up on it on social media about the Fulham game. It was quickly retracted. But um, mm, yeah. I was speaking to somebody who was a, a corporate uh, a corporate box holder at St James's Park uh, the other day, and he was saying that he'd had an email to say the tickets were on sale for the Fulham game. Um, and that the way that they were breaking it down was 500 to corporate corporate ticket holders, 1500 to Newcastle United season ticket holders, and um, essentially it was 115 pound a ticket for those in the corporate boxes. Which, I, you know, I, yesterday's show I, I'd said was probably extreme, but doing a little bit of research before we came on to today's show, um, it seems that that's about right for for a corporate ticket. Um, but I suppose. You know, is that a fair breakdown? Five hundred for those in the boxes and fifteen hundred for the ordinary supporters and you know the season ticket holders who go. I mean, what, what was your take on that? Obviously, now it's been refunded because it doesn't look as if we're going to be dropping into tier two. It looks as if Newcastle will stay in tier three on the sixteenth. Um. Yeah. So I used to. I used to obviously work in hospitality in Newcastle. So yeah, one hundred and fifteen pound is you know maybe a little bit higher than usual because they, they need to you know recoup the money somewhere but roughly around that price is probably right obviously i don't know what they're going to do in terms of that because um obviously you get meals and stuff and in places now you you know it, it's hot and cold starters usually they're not going to have obviously cold starters sitting around because of corona and stuff so i don't know how they're going to do that um whether they're going to split between boxes it, it just seems a bit daft really because you're going to need more staff for less people so um especially with everyone spread out and you'd think, surely as well, that, you, well, you know, I'm saying surely, football's a business now, you need the money back, you haven't had the money that you will get from the um, the boxes for months now. So I can see them obviously wanting to put a little bit, few more people in the boxes that are going to pay for the tickets for the corporate boxes to get a little bit more money. But if you want the atmosphere back at games, you want to be giving the majority of those tickets to fans who are sitting, you know, in the stands to get the atmosphere back going, just to give the players a little bit something to play for, as we've just mentioned. Um, so it doesn't surprise us in a way. Um, it is just a little bit disappointing to know that, you know, they'd rather have that chunk of people sitting in the boxes because the boxes are like miles up. They're not even anywhere near the pitch. Um, they're like miles back in the Milburn stand. So, you know, it is a bit difficult, but I can see why they're doing it and I can understand it at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, obviously academic now, Samantha, because, you know, the game is not going to have fans there. But it's, uh, yeah, it's just interesting. I just wondered if you felt it was a fair split. I mean, 52,000 supporters who can regularly attend Newcastle's games. Obviously, if we knock the, you know, the, the few thousand off of away supporters, it's still, you know, 47, 48,000 Newcastle fans who would, would need to be balloted. But to, to suddenly say, well, 500 are going to be corporate, and fifteen hundred are going to be uh, season ticket holders. It's it, it just seemed a little bit unbalanced to me. 
Yeah, I think it's indicative of the way that fans are treated. I know that the other clubs have done something similar. I think I read that Chelsea had um, corporate packages that were hundreds and hundreds of pounds, had champagne included, and their fans went absolutely ballistic about that. Um, you know, the game's supposed to be for the fans. It's supposed to be for the benefit of the fans and the players. And putting 500 people in corporate boxes, as Kendall said, you know, you have more knowledge of the, the setup of those. That's not helping the players. That's not getting the atmosphere into the ground. That's getting money. Um, and I don't think, you know, we're not as impacted as other clubs when it comes to money. Yes, it's not great, but there's absolutely no reason in my eyes why 500 tickets should be going to corporate aside from money. And, you know, if you want to get behind the team, then you give those 2,000 tickets to the fans. A lot of them who, you know, are still trying to get refunds because that was an absolute travesty, the process. Um, so, again, I don't think it looks good for the club, but I think that every club is doing something similar. Um, and I, I don't agree with it. It's not the right thing. But, you know, it's not something that... They, you know, they could have consulted with the fans on it, but it's just purely revenue. Okay. Yeah, Sab, what's your take on, on this situation with, you know, Newcastle obviously announcing that, uh, you know, the, the people who were going to go to the Fulham game, as I say, it's academic, that's not going to happen now. But, um, you know, what was, your, what was your take on the split of tickets? Yeah, I mean, it didn't surprise me because football's just all about money now, isn't it? And that's all that matters um, to the clubs and things. But it's... I think it's unfair because, like Sam said, you want your fans to get behind the team and not be sat in corporate boxes, you know, and it just seems silly, especially after fans have been away for so long. And, you know, and like Sam said as well, with the season tickets, I think the fans need to be treated better and consulted on things more. But obviously, of Newcastle at the moment and how it's been, you know, for 13 years, that's never going to happen. But no, I don't think that's fair. And I think that, you know, you need the fans out there getting behind the players and... Sadly, you know, it's more it, money comes first, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it definitely does. Um, another interesting point that's uh, come up over the last few days on the show is is about ESM, uh, Kendall. Obviously, he's out of the team at the minute. We had that much publicised uh, rumour that was going around on social media that there'd been some kind of spat between him and Steve Bruce and that he was booked on the flight to go to Crystal Palace but then didn't go. Um, you know, all kinds of rumours coming out. Um, but obviously, Steve Bruce runs the dressing room in, in that old-fashioned way. What happens in the dressing room stays in the dressing room, um, which which I agree with quite right. But um, the question I suppose I want to ask is, if, A if ASM is fit, um, you know, is he going to get back into this team? Because, you know, they've had back-to-back -back wins. Uh, we know they haven't been, you know, convincing wins, but, you know, a win against West Brom and a win against Crystal Palace, two teams which you would say are teams you needed to beat, six-pointers, I think I called them, because, you know, it's, it's against teams that are going to struggle. And, uh, you know, we always see ourselves in a bit of a relegation battle uh, season in, season out. So two huge wins, which gives us a lot of breathing space. But would you bring ASM back in? Is he, is he somebody who could get back in? Because... I thought Richie did well um, yesterday, and, and Richie's uh, Richie's my kind of player. He's a seven yeah. out of ten. Um, you know, he's, he's not gonna he's not gonna dazzle you with like some kind of scintillating run past eight players and slot it into the bottom corner. But he's gonna give you a graft, and uh, he's a leader as well on the pitch. Yeah, that and that's what we need at the moment. We need leader. We need passion, and we need hard workers because um obviously as we've all mentioned this whole show we are very complacent we're very defeatist um you know our heads go down as soon as something goes wrong and um asm for me is that is one of them players who does that as soon as something goes wrong he makes a bad decision um you know his head goes down straight away and you can tell his mindset's not there as soon as things happen like that um for me, he's so talented, but his final third is very, very inconsistent. And his decision-making is sometimes questionable, to say the least. Um, we we know he's got that spark. We've all seen the talent that he's got. Fans of other clubs, um, you know, people that I'm on podcasts with, Man United fans, love him. They think he's brilliant. Um, but they don't see, you know, it as in-depth as we do when we're watching a game. There's no denying that he's talented, but right now we need to, if we're going to play the way that we are, we need to graph these wins out. We don't need someone who's going to dribble, dribble past five players and then, you know, scuff a shot like away. Like we need the drive and we need like precision going forward because that's what we don't have. 
and um, we just like lumping the long balls up and hoping someone's there on the end of it especially obviously if Shelby's in midfield um so I think I'll probably obviously sit him on the bench and maybe not start him but if we are struggling for that creativity and we are struggling for something coming off the wing um especially if you're going to pay Joe Linton there for example I, I don't really know what the crack is going to be now at the moment um but I, well, maybe he's bringing him on his, you know, an impact sub for his first game back to see what he does. We've got a lot of hard fixtures coming up and teams are probably going to be looking at our squad and he's probably maybe, to them, is going to be the standout player that they need to, you know, direct um, towards. He gets fouled a lot. He's not protected by referees, which is another issue uh, along the line. Um, yeah, so for me, I don't think he slots straight back into that squad. I think he needs to come back show what he's made of because he went after he signed that contract and we had that couple of like really bad games he just went missing uh, his head wasn't there his attitude wasn't there um, and he was just half the player that we we all know he probably could be so yeah I think he probably impact sub next game see if he you know needs to come on and do anything give give us a bit of creativity but we need to graft out them wins and if he wants to be part of the team he needs to get his mentality straight and know that he needs to start working really really hard to bring something to the team yeah, uh, he's a good sub to have, Samantha. Kendall says that she would have him on the bench to start with, the SM. Uh, would you have him back as a, as a start in the starting eleven if he was fully fit, or would you do the same as Kendall? Same as Kendall, spot on. I mean, his attitude hasn't been right. He has been a little bit more vocal on social media, which has been nice to see. But, I mean, he needs to get his hot head down and work hard. You know, you look at what Joe Linton's done and... You know, he's taken it all on board. He's been criticised. He's been moved about. And we've now finally found a role for him, which is having a positive influence on the team. I think I tweeted earlier, I don't care if he scores goals or gets assists. They're as important as each other to me. And he's doing that. So for me, I don't see where um, ASM fits at the minute. I think, as I said, he comes off the bench as an impact sub and gives Bruce something to think about. The, The way that the team is at the minute... I, I would like for us to just continue to keep it the way that it is. I think we've got a bit of balance at the minute. I thought Richie was, you know, I'm not his biggest fan, but I thought he was, sorry, Seb, um, but I thought he was good yesterday and he was vocal and he shied it. And that's really been missing because Lascelles hasn't been doing it. So, um, you know, right wing, I'm not sure about Um but I think we've got the balance that we've been missing. So I see no reason to change it. And I certainly wouldn't see a reason for dropping Joe Linton. The guy's just picking up his confidence. You don't want to, to ruin that. But how amazing is it to have actual options to come off the bench that can change games? So he just needs to get his head down, stop sulking and do his talking on the pitch. None of this rolling around because you've been tapped on the ankles. Yes, he doesn't get protection get up get in position again and for me whether it's linked to the contract or not he hasn't been doing it enough and you know if he hadn't whatever happened i would have dropped him anyway because i don't think he was having a positive impact on our games so i would stick stick with things the way they are grind out the results and then if we have a little bit of kind of trajectory start to introduce some new things but only based on people putting the work in Yep, fair enough. Sab, what's your take? Do you agree with the girls? Yeah, I do. But I also think it depends on who we're facing. Like yesterday when I was watching us, I was thinking if we had ASM on that pitch, he's got room to make a bit of creativity and do his runs um, against the side that we faced yesterday. And I think, you know, it depends. He, he tends to crumble, which is it doesn't surprise me because he has got a bit of history of his old club and his attitude and things. And it has dropped off recently. Um, but like Sam said, he has been then active on Twitter again. Um, so you don't know if there's been a fallout or not. Um, but I think that the problem is that he does get, like Sam said, he does get clipped over and things. And then it depends if we're having a bad game. He'll just make that into an injury until he's subbed off. And he's done that a couple of times this season, which is so frustrating to see because you don't know if it's real. Or if it's because he knows he's having a bad game and he just wants to come mm. off and he you know, doesn't want to get any hassle for it. So he needs more consistency with, you know, just just try, you know, he wanted the open role, that didn't work. And then since then he's disappeared. 
and I think I probably put him on the bench to be fair now now I've thought about it <laughs> um but I did think yesterday could have made a bit of a difference but no put him put him on the bench you know what I really mean I really like him as a player but I just find that his consistency just isn't there at all yeah, good stuff. Okay, we're going to finish off this week's show uh, just with a look ahead to Leeds. Uh, Leeds United, of course. Uh, Newcastle play them on Wednesday night. It's a six o'clock kickoff, and it's on Prime. Uh, so uh, if you get Amazon Prime, you'll be able to watch the game live on there. Kendall, this is a tough game. I mean, back-to-back wins for Steve Bruce against Crystal Palace and West Brom um, is is all very well. But Leeds United, um, you know, newly promoted, uh, you know, team firing on all cylinders. Reminders a little bit of the entertainers uh, when they came up. Not as good, but um, certainly got this attack and ethos with their their uh, extrovert manager. So it, um, it it should be an interesting fixture this one. Yeah, I think so. Um, especially if, you know, if we have this mindset that we had in the first, you know, the very, very first tenth of the game yesterday, um, Leeds do concede goals. They're not defensively sound, although they do score a lot. So both ends of their pitch, there's sort of action going on. If we have a mindset, which we've said this for weeks now, we've said it for games. If we go into a game and have an attacker mindset, which is very unusual, then we can actually go at them. Um for me, they've got a little bit more quality than us, uh, especially attacking-wise. Um, you know, they've got a system that Bielsa has instilled in them, has instilled in them from the championship. But a lot of people will probably look at the league table and say, well, you know, they're not... We're pr- pretty much, you know, roughly similar um, points-wise and um, things like that. I just think they have a little bit of an edge to us, um, which I wish we had. Like, I wish we had that sort of manager who, like, players want to play for and the you can sort of there is a system there's an identity in the team you can identify key players and it goes from there um and their goalkeeper is very similar to Carl Darlow as well um Melier I think he's called he's really really good so um I think it'll be a close game I think it'll be tight I say that now they'll probably outplay us but um I always say the wrong thing and the opposite (laughs) happens um but yeah I think it'll probably you know be like a 2-1 sort of situation um, because I do think it's tight and if obviously Wilson's fit and stuff and we can have a bit of creativity like we did at the latter half of the game yesterday we can probably we can score at least but yeah I just think they've got a little tiny bit of an edge to us um, even though you know as I say in the league we're pretty, looking pretty similar to each other at the moment 2-1 win to Newcastle Kendall no 2-1 win to Leeds 2-1 win to Leeds yeah two, even though I do wish it was Newcastle but I think yeah probably Leeds just edges it for me ok Samantha uh, your take on uh, Newcastle's trip to Leeds uh, I think they'll outplay us. Um, the one thing that I'm interested about is if we're going to have any players back and also if Hayden's going to be able to start another game so soon um, because, you know, he was out for 10 days with COVID. He played out of his skin yesterday. You know, it's a quick turnaround, um, but we don't really have anyone else. <laughs> so I, I think it'll be interesting to see who plays. Um, and maybe going for a 1-1 draw. I don't think we'll see much of the ball. I think we'll drop deep. I think it, it's going to be a challenge. You know, they'll probably look like Brazil playing us, to be honest. And it'll be <laughs> frustrating. So we just need to try and grind out a result. But, you know, I think Darlow's going to have a lot of saves to make. I don't think it's going to be pretty. That's okay, because I think I just have an acceptance by that I don't expect us to play good football. What I do want to see is um, the team a lot more switched on and... Um, you know, Richie really trying to get us forward. So I'd take a 1-1 one, one straight away, but, um, you know, it, it really depends what Newcastle team turns up. If they come out slow out of the blocks, I can see us being one down in the first 10 minutes because I think Leeds will come out firing all cylinders um, and then it'll be how we react to that. I, again, I do feel slightly better that we have some game changers on the bench, but I'm you know, apart from fitness issues, I don't think he's going to change the team from West Brom. He just needs to get them more fired up. Yeah, OK. A uh, special mention to your background today, Samantha. You, you're definitely the star of the show with those stars above you. <laughs> De- definitely. <laughs> and who's your little friend on your shoulder? <laughs> ah, <Hello>. and you can't... <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant, good stuff. Okay, Sav, uh, finally to you. Leeds, obviously on Wednesday night, give us your uh, thoughts and your prediction. I'm a bit scared, not going to lie. <laughs> I just have this horrible feeling. It's been one that I've been dreading. Um, 
I just think that, yeah, they are thereabouts the same as us, but I think they can outplay us all day long with how we set up and how we play. And I know that Steve Bruce said that there were some players coming back tomorrow, I think. Um, so hopefully, you know, there's some quite key ones that we will need. Um, but no, I've just got, oh, do you know what, Wednesday evening, I think I'm just going to sit and get drunk to numb it out because I just think I, that is what I'm preparing for. But then again, I prepared for that yesterday and obviously that didn't happen and I was actually quite happy and I ended that match so well, which was great. But um, it didn't last throughout the day though. But, <laughs> but no, no, I just think that, I think they're gonna, they are that sort of team that will run at us, we'll sit back, we'll defend it, but we can't defend, so that'll all go wrong. And I think it's gonna be two, three nil. I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I've just got a really nasty feeling about this one. Uh, watching them play, they're like, they're one of those teams that on, on their day will, you know, embarrass us. Big shout out to our sponsors, newworkwear.com, specialists in the supply and branding of clothing for the workplace. And uh, is anybody under another hat? Can you get under that? Yeah, oh, that's brilliant. Good effort. <laughs> oh, Big... ab, that was my ab workout for the week. <laughs> that's, that, that... <laughs> Brilliant stuff. And a uh, big shout out to qtechshop.co.uk, the makers of pool tables and snooker tables in Walls End in Newcastle and other things as well, including our t-shirts, which you can get from newcastlelegends.com. Don't forget, if you can't tune into the YouTube program, uh, all of our shows are available on iTunes and Spotify uh, for you to listen when you're out and about. And if you want to help us, please just like, comment share and of course subscribe just hit the little newcastle legends logo in the corner and uh, you can subscribe to the channel and you will not miss a show girls been an absolute pleasure to have you on as always have a good week look forward to seeing you next monday take care Bye. 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 And don't forget, throughout the whole of December, we are also running our campaign, Think Before You Talk.